So, lads, we've got. Have we got a question? Uh, definitely. Uh, have we got I, a question? Go. I will go to Patreon, George. Patreon, George. George, you got Patreon. George has got a Patreon. He oh, sells wow. nudes on there. <laughs> That's OnlyFans. <laughs> No, but George, I feel like George, if he were to sell nudes, would do it on Patreon. Oh, George's got, you know, a few answers um, we have to respect him. Now. Tyler Steve says, why didn't Babs get the most courageous performance award from the London Awards after his watery eye incident? <laughs> I mean, it, I was heartbroken. I was, heart, I was heartbroken. And I think next year, if I get another watery eye, uh, well, I would like to be in contention once again. I would Can like we just, back. how mad is it that Ange won manager of the year over David Moyes and Arteta? A joke. A joke. It's, I mean, it's a joke. It's a joke. And I think it's because he said mate. That's what it is. If Mikel Arteta starts stop saying guys and he starts saying mate, right? <laughs> He, he might have won it. He might have won it. But anyways, guys, welcome back to the Cannon Podcast after another stupendous victory. You know, I keep doing the five things you learn, but every time I also score six, I have to do six things you learn. So I have to think of an extra thing. And I'm, I don't oh, mind mate. it, by the way. It's, it's not it's not that bad. It's, it's a good problem to have. But it's as bad lads, as the watery eye. <laughs> yeah, nearly as bad as the watery eye. But anyways, lads, we're back again. How are we doing? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Mate, what a performance. Wow. What a performance. What a night. Look, I, I'm, I'm ecstatic about the game. I really wanted to talk big picture stuff because i feel as though that a lot of the the little intricate play we'll get into we get into the performances but who are arsenal who are this arsenal team and i think it's time to have a conversation about who we are what we represent because i'm seeing a lot of trepidation on the timeline i'm seeing a lot of not wanting to go the extra mile and say yes we are playing the best football in the league yes we are do what we are getting because i i, I feel as though we aren't we aren't understanding some of the stats that we read out as fun little banter things like i find every match we all do this i can find you two or three stats of arsenal breaking records this season mate three three consecutive home away um you know with over five nils like every stat that you look at it starts saying oh that's nice oh that's nice there's another record broken Bakayo Saka oh first player with you know 50 goals and 50 assists alongside Bruno Fernandez, Mohamed Salah and 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 everyone's kind of saying how great that is but I don't think they're understanding the impact of what that means and I really feel that this young Arsenal team were always going to be due an explosion and it was going to come at a time together just by nature of how young the squad is, there was going to come a point where it all clicked. And it wasn't necessarily things that we had done on the training pitch. It wasn't necessarily things that, you know, we just change a particular tactic or a position. I think it was just accumulation and maturity. And that maturity was going to happen together with the squad. And it's going to witness kind of this really exponential rise. And I think I'm seeing this. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but how many five nils have Arsenal had in the last, let's say, decade prior to Mikel Arteta how many five nil have we had and look at it how many have we had since Dubai we have such smart patron members I'm sure somebody will do that for me but I certainly don't remember and the YouTube with members. regularity and YouTube members of course we can't forget them um, but I can't remember with regularity Arsenal no matter the opposition destroying teams five six nil on a regular basis like Guys, we're almost reaching an eight-game run where we have dismantled the league since the turn of the year on um, uh, over a three-goal margin. I mean, yesterday was the first game that we stopped our two goals per half record. That's that's incredible. And I and I think I also saw a stat that in the in the, in um, seven consecutive games, Arsenal have scored the most goals since the Centurion Cities. More of than their years. seven game consecutive run more yeah and so i'm just i'm just trying to understand how do we as commentators not get carried away but at the same time give the due praise that the boys and the team deserves that's something i'm struggling with right now i think a lot i think a lot of the praise comes from fans when they when they think that we're over the line i keep saying that because i think fans are very reluctant especially after last year because they thought the last year was the year when Nelson spa you know, smashes the goal into the back of the net at the last minute and they think this is the year, right? And you're getting there. And then obviously it didn't quite happen. I think that's why fans are so scared because they've seen a storyline too often and, you know, maybe it's the holding onto the past too often. But let's talk about the present and the Arsenal attack because as George says, Alex, it's clicked just where we needed the most. And of course, it was a massive, major conversation early in the year. We were talking about all the time, how can we fix the attack? How can we fix the attack? It looks like the attack has been fixed, but how? 
Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> I think uh, what is it like thirty-two goals, thirty-one goals in the last seven matches. We yeah, we we are in unbelievable form. I just want, I want to briefly before I come on to that response to what George said. I I do I do think I I understand. I think we said it in the Instagram reaction. I understand people who are afraid to kind of put that praise on the team because we've been here. It feels like we've been here before i don't think we have been here before but people feel like we've been here before that's that's the point it's, it's it's not relevant what the stats and the numbers are it's it's about how people feel it's an emotional thing right and i think people feel we've been here before we've we've had good runs but we never quite get over the line and i understand those people i think this is different but i do think there are people who understandably want to kind of pump the brakes and say you know let's not get carried away etc cetera, etc cetera. but all this is is omens for the future to say that if we can get to this level of performance if we can do that in the Premier League if we can make Sheffield United look as bad as we did last night and they were also poor um, you know what does that mean for the future what does that mean for the future of the team which is incredibly exciting but yeah the attack has been has been sensational look there's a number of simple factors Um, players finding form players like Kai Havertz um, who we should probably come on to at some point in, in more detail um, I think there's you know also we're finishing our chances <laughs> that's you know like the, these these things are basic but you know I think uh, Declan Rice there were some comments from him today saying something along the lines of you know people were saying there's a narrative a couple of weeks ago oh we need a strike or whatever and I you know I I, I I have to stay, say I still think we do need something else. You know, it might sound crazy to say in this run, but we know if we look at the the, the, the year as a, as, a, as a totality, there have been times where we've wanted some kind of different profile. But I think really what we found is the fluidity again. I think if we look at how, um, how we're attacking, especially away from home, especially against these types of teams, we're seeing players pop up in in positions that you just don't expect them to be in. Saka finding a lot more time inside. Same with Martinelli. Uh, Erdegaard drifting over to the left-hand side. It, uh, there was a point during the season where it felt like everything in, the, in our attack was very, very choreographed. Everyone stayed in their own lane and there wasn't the same kind of fluidity and, and rotation of positions there was last season. I think we're now seeing, you know, how would we describe what Saka and Martinelli do? What do we actually say what they are? Are they wingers? They're not wingers. Are they inside forwards? They're not inside forwards. Are they second strikers? They're not second strikers. What are they? They have this kind of almost new hybrid role where they basically go where they want. And in certain positions, they remain wide because they need to stretch the pitch and stretch Sheffield playing a four at the back against them, which I can't understand. And then Chris Wilder blaming the players. <laughs> how, how that works, I don't know. Um, you know, the, they're stretching the pitch at certain points. Then you see Saka in the central striker position. Then you see Martinelli there. Then you see Odegaard out wide. Then you see Havertz. We're seeing the one brain football finally being played out in the attack. The attack is finally having its moment where all the stuff that we've seen in our first and second phase is finally reaching that forward area where there's the confidence is is, uh, was, is brewing, the, the players are in form. But I think for me, the main factor is we found that fluidity again. We found that ability to interchange, create different angles, create different spaces, have moments where someone's, you know, um, in some way you don't expect. And then all the patterns, like how many cutbacks did we score yesterday? Yeah. yeah. Like then all the patterns start to make sense because Pete, you know, we know against Newcastle, for example, Martinelli comes out to the right hand side. He knows someone's attacking the six yard box. He knows it because there will be someone before it didn't feel like we had, we had that sort of rotation and, and understanding. And I think that's what we've, we found certainly in the last few weeks. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to timing. And I think the players, you're right, have got it down to a T now because of practice, you know, over the course of the season and also confidence of knowing, you know, understanding where the player is going to be. But I also think it comes down to chemistry and relationships. And a player that's really helping that right now is Kai Havertz. You know, not only is he, is he playing up front and, you know, scoring goals as well. I think he's got five GA in his last three league games, but also in terms of just linking play. And I, I like the most about Havertz is he's, he's very two-way. He can go to the left and go to the right. He's not, not going to be a bias in, in my opinion. Um, and I think we have to ask the question because we were talking about earlier, but that was probably for me Havertz's best Arsenal performance playing as a striker. So George, has Kai arrived? I think Kai Havertz is kind of somebody for me that um, he's not arrived in a sense, but he's absolutely somebody that has um, started to answer some of the questions that he's yet to answer all season. That really is kind of where I'm at with it. I think he's been brilliant. Um, you can't take away some of the output that he's produced. I mean, he's produced more open play goals than Marcus Rashford, than Cole Palmer. He's almost equaled Grant Xhaka's goal and assist tally of last season. Um, I think he scored the same amount of goals as James Madison as well. So 
Uh, I don't think it's been as bad as what people have said, but also what is true is we haven't used him in the right way. And I do think that his performances at nine are much different from his performances in midfield. And one thing that really encapsulated for me the change in Kai Havertz and that self-belief kind of arc was the goal. The goal was brilliant. The goal was, I think, authoritative. It was aggressive. And it was him taking charge. And there was moments in the match, even later towards the end in the second half, where Jesus is on a breakaway and he takes over from Jesus to go and continue the run. And, and I just think that's kind of the aggressiveness in possession that I think most fans are looking at. Now, is that enough? Is that worth 65 million pounds? No, it, it isn't worth 65 million pounds. But if you start doing that on a more consistent basis, then that leads to other things. It leads to greater impact on the team. And I think you start to do those things. You start to see the value of what Kai Havertz brings. Right now, he's been able to add a level of fluidity for us. There is a certain level of uh, doubt that happens when you've got a striker like him, somebody that you can go over the top of a block with, but also is comfortable coming deep to receive and forcing center backs to make a decision. Do I follow? Do I stay in my line? There is a bit of jeopardy to that. But fundamentally, I just think it's a Kai Havertz that's got a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more aggressive in his actions, and we're just seeing that intent maximize right now. Um, and I, I do have a parallel between him and Jesus. They're on opposite sides of the coin, but they have the same issue, where for me, the aggressiveness in their actions means that they rush their decisions. For Kai Havertz, he doesn't take enough risks. And so often at times, those decision-making, it can be poor. Jesus, I feel as though that he does too much in possession, and that still leads to poor decision-making. Together, if they can meet and kind of meet in the middle, we would both have players that make the right decisions more consistently and i think that's the big gabriel point. havertz yes gabriel havertz. he's just gonna have a baby <laughs> yes. he's the it's the new it's the new player that we've signed um anyways and i think that kai havertz has just done a brilliant job lately he's in good form babs as you say he's had a couple goal and assists in those last three games something like five so he's himself is in good individual form it's just how far can we take this moving forward and what can we build upon that um and I think that he starts answering those questions the more aggressive he is in possession. Yeah, he's, he's playing at a very good level as a striker right now, and it has opened the debate in the Arsenal fan base. So if, now that Gabriel Jesus is back fit and available, you know, we're not know for how long, but he's fit and available. We've got some massive games coming up, Porto in the Champions League, Man City in the, in the Premier League. Who do you start in that game, Alex? Do you keep the inform Havertz, who's not just playing well and scoring goals, but also helping the rest of the team, you know, combine and score more goals? Or do you throw back Jesus, who, in, who obviously on his day is a fantastic striker, but we all know his players' problems also down, come down to finishing. Mm. Um, I, I think I said on a recent podcast, it's I'm not a fan of changing winning teams. I, d I don't like it. I think unless you really feel that there's something really specific technically or tactically that you want to do, for me, if you've got a team that are in the kind of form that we're in, don't change it. You know, you know, and we've, we've I think is that the last how how many games we've gone unchanged now apart from Jorginho. Um, I think I, the Newcastle game was the same lineup, but the only game I can think of was was Porto. Yeah, no, no, it, it was Trossard was the one starting. I think before I think, Porto, I and think maybe since, as well. Since about Liverpool, nine or ten of them have basically played every single game, and yeah, yeah. there's a that, you know that we're looking better for that. I think partly, you know, it's not all down to that, and I wouldn't just put that as a single factor. But I wouldn't change a winning team. Um, but again, I always say this about you know people say, "Well, party get back in your team right now." No, but 20 minutes of football could change that. You know I mean? It's like, you know, course, we, we might course. we might say, you know, after 20 minutes, Jorginho is not quite doing it. There's progressive passing options that I don't think he's taking. Let's get Thomas Partey on. I also think we saw yesterday with, with Partey and Jesus coming on a little bit of rustiness. Uh, Jesus had a couple of opportunities where I thought he should have had a shot and he, and, he, um, and he didn't take it. I think actually Jesus would, maybe he'd miss, but I think actually Jesus would take those shots normally. So I think we're seeing a little bit of confidence that we're not seeing uh, in, in habits that we're not seeing in, in Jesus and, and Partey. I think really, I've said this before, but I do think it's worth saying, I think I agree with George in terms of the aggressiveness in his actions and in, in the final third and in his passing and his on-ball work. But also for me, it's about the, yes, the confidence that Mikel's given him saying, you know, we love him. We, we want him here, playing him through bad form. You imagine as a person, you come into your job and you know at the moment you're not you're not having the best time. They've spent a lot of money headhunting you from another firm and you're coming and you're not quite delivering and someone takes you by the arm and says, look, I know you're good. I believe in you. You're going to get through this. You imagine the bond you could build with that person. I think that's what we're seeing and, and he's being slowly paid back. 
but I also think it's the clarification of what his role is, both for the fan base and and the observer and for Kai Havertz. As a, as as a central midfield player, I felt as though there's a bit more kind of cerebrality, if that's a word, to what you have to do. There's a bit more kind of, I could take this road, I could take that road, I could play this ball, I could do that. As a centre forward, as I say, as I've always said, his role is kind of refined a little bit more. If I'm here, I'm going to spin and make that run in behind. If I'm in, in the D, I'm going to play off and, and, and play the wall pass to Jorginho. It's a little bit clearer. His brain gets out of the way. I think that's one of his things. He's such a clever footballer. I wonder sometimes whether he slightly analyzes the game a little bit too much while he's playing it. Um, and I think it just really clarifies his role. And we then go, oh, Kai Havertz scores a goal. He must have had a good game because he, he played centre forward. It just makes everything a lot, a lot clearer. Do I think that's the absolute maximizing of what you get from a Kai Havertz? I don't know. And I don't actually think so if we had more of a backboard centre uh, center forward, which, we, which we've spoken about before. But I think at the moment, in the confidence and the form he's in, it, he is our best centre forward right now. But again, people, you hit people here that go, no, it's Jesus, no, it's... No, 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 ignore that. On the 5th of March, today, Kai Havertz is our best centre forward and that might change halfway through Brentford. <laughs> I reserve the yeah. right. <laughs> it's, it's a good conversation to have. And in terms of Havertz up front, every single game he's played this year, he's created opportunities for himself and the team as well. And I think the fact that it's been such a consistent theme now from whether it's City in Liverpool to games like this as well, you can't ignore it. You can't ignore it. And I think a major reason why Jesus starts for Arsenal is because he's so threatening and he helps us you know, reach a new level. But Havertz is reaching that same level and, and almost doing more at times and creating even more clear opportunities. And I think you know, the player is in such good form as well. And the Chelsea fans always tell us about Havertz in March. It's fantastic. Well, fantastic for us because we've got Man City in March and Porto in March. So if Havertz can score goals in those games, I'll take it. And I think right now he's on seven goals. Um, and I think someone mentioned it earlier, more, more non penalty goals than Cole Palmer more than Rashford, I think, as well, and Kulisevsky and players like that. So he's doing all right right now. He's doing all right. But you know who else is doing all right? Our boy Declan Rice. Playing as a number eight. Freiburg as a number eight. Ten GAs already this season. George, take it away. Thanks for checking out the Canon Podcast. To hear the full episode, sign up as a YouTube member on this channel or go to patreon.com forward slash the Pod.